Welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week, I talked to Ben Savin, the director of Minnesota JCC's Camp Butwin. We talk about how Ben ended up running the camp he went to as a kid, making the best out of last summer, and planning for 2021 in a pandemic on this week's Who the Folk podcast. Ben Savin, welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're excited to talk to you. You are the director of Camp Butwin, which is now part of the Minnesota JCC, uh, as opposed to just the St. Paul JCC. Uh, tell me a little bit about how how long you've been at Butwin and, and the Minnesota J and, and how you uh, sort of got your start in camping. Yeah, great. Well, I guess I'm what some people might call a lifer. I first got off the bus at Camp Butwin when I was about five or six back in the 90s. And I do know that when I came home from camp that day and I couldn't stop talking about it, my my mom was was quick to say this kid's going to be the camp director someday. Um, but little did she know that her prediction would be correct. Um, <laughs> I, so I went to Camp Butwin for many years. I, I went on to do overnight camp at Camp Osteria in Wisconsin. Um, Worked in kitchens, did some different things after overnight camp, and eventually kind of on a lark when I was about 19, I thought, I just don't want to be in a hot restaurant kitchen all summer long. I wonder what's up at Butwin. So I went back. I interviewed with Michael Waldman, who was the director at the time. Um, It was pretty late in the season, close to camp starting, and I remember really clearly he said something to the effect of, Ben, you grew up at camp. I remember you, and I think you're going to do a great job. I also have other candidates that have way more experience working with kids, but I want you to be at camp. So I'm going to offer you the job. Just don't screw it up. And I really, I like, I took that so seriously. I really took it to heart. I remember it still to this day. Um, and I kind of fell in love with camp. I really fell in love working with kids. I, I changed my major to education and um, finished my degree with a background in education, planning to teach English. But right after I graduated, I found a job working at the JCC full-time in the early childhood program. Stuck with that for a few years. Camp Butwin assistant directorship opened up. So I, I had that opportunity and eventually made my way on to be the camp director, which is where I am today. And I feel like it's a really huge, fortunate thing and a lucky thing. Not many people get to be the director of the camp they went to as a kid, even in the camping field. It's it's all it's a it's an honor and it's also a lot of pressure. I take it pretty seriously. It's kind of surreal when you when you sort of put it in those terms, right? That you were you were there as a five-year-old and now you're the director of the, of the whole thing. I, I, there's no, I mean, obviously your mother saw something. She, you know, she sort of called it. I was just hooked on camp. I don't know. So what was your major before you, you switched to education? So I was pursuing my generals and I wasn't, I didn't have a ton of direction. I was, like I said, I was working in restaurant kitchens and I was exploring the idea of like, do I want to go into cooking? Do I think I want to own a restaurant someday? Um, I'd kind of thrown myself into that and I was chipping away at generals in the meantime. Um, And then after a summer at camp and spending some time working in the after-school program here at the JCC in the, in the school year, I changed over to English and education and I, and I figured I would teach middle school English. That was my plan back then. Do you ever think about the roads not taken? Either like, you know, chef or own, you know, restaurateur or, you know, English teacher? You know, I I could I could see someday going back and teaching. Not not anytime soon, but someday. And okay. as far as uh, as far as the restaurant piece, um I I've kept my my foot in that door just a tiny bit and I and I Pre, pre-COVID, obviously, I would moonlight a couple nights a week at a local restaurant as a host just because I just, I like that environment. I find it stimulating. I find it fun. And, you know, I just, I like to be there. So that was one of my little side hustles, if you will. Which restaurant? Uh, it's Non-Vietnamese Bistro on University Avenue. And little plug, they have excellent food. They're open for takeout only. So anyone that likes a good bowl of pho or something like that, check them out. Excellent. Good plug. That sounds great. So you mentioned COVID and obviously, you know, part timing in a restaurant, certainly, uh, you know, no need for hosts at a restaurant uh, for the over the course of the last year. 
but obviously your role is, uh, you know, in camping has changed a lot also. What, I guess from your, where you sit, take us through some of, you know, the, the roller coaster of what that last year was like. Cause obviously it was, um, it was a wild ride. Yeah, it was a super wild ride. I mean, I think it was the first week of March when I think we were sitting here at the JCC having meetings thinking, what is this going to be like this thing that we're seeing in the news, this is going to impact us. And we, we, we start to really realize this is not going anywhere. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen, but we need to start getting ready. And at that time, I don't think anyone had any anticipation that it was going to be what it was, but um, we started having conversations. I remember we were just approaching our um, production of our middle school musical Frozen. Um, I also oversee our, our youth theater program. And I just remember that first press conference that Governor Walls gave. It was a Sunday morning. And that Sunday afternoon was our first tech rehearsal, which means that we were one week away, under a week away from opening night. And we, we had to cancel that tech rehearsal. And then we ended up having to cancel the, the performances. And I mean, for those middle school kids, that's just devastating. And we start to, we start to go into, into the, the shutdowns and we're thinking, what are we going to do with camp? Well, with the JCCs being, you know, on track for, for becoming one at that point, um, I was lucky to have the, the Minneapolis Sabus camp camp team as a resource as well and we started putting our heads together and thinking what is this going to look like and I don't know I think that we were hesitant about the idea of doing a virtual camp but we were also very hesitant about the idea of doing an in-person camp and as we got closer and closer to the summer and we had to start making some decisions we we made the decision in in a conversation with our teams here at the J and also in conversation with other local camps um, that it was not going to be feasible to open on time. It was not going to be feasible to open in the way that we, we hoped that we could. And we held out as long as we could because we sure. wanted to open. You know, and there's so much like, you know, I told you before we started recording, I, I spent a couple summers working at Butwin and, and so much of what makes Butwin different is the bus ride out to camp. And, and once you, I mean, that that's a big piece of, you know, the socialization, the fun, the, you know, sort of getting fired up for what the day is going to be. And when you take that away, it definitely changes what opportunities there are going to be the camp looks like. But obviously, you know, putting putting kids in a cramped bus seems like a you, you say it out loud now and it, it just seems like a, t- <laughs> a terrible idea. Thank you for not doing that, because that's, uh, you know, just, you know, super spreader event right there every day, possibly. Yeah. I mean, there, there were definitely a few, a few really, really major factors that, that we had to figure a way to overcome in order to feel like camp could possibly be on the table and and transportation was certainly Mm -hmm. right there at the top of that list. How can we do this? Can we do this? And I think we had that question during a camp, director's round table that you guys hosted on on the jews are tired i think that was one of the parent questions that was one of the parent questions absolutely exactly. we still thought maybe we can do this and and so and so ultimately we we made the decision to cancel and we canceled camp yeah. um but there's more because meanwhile in the background we were planning a virtual camp um and we were able to offer that to the community at no cost and although I think in, in, in having conversations with, with the the camp team here in St. Paul and the camp team over at Sabus JCC, um, which was still at that time Sabus JCC, getting kids on screens is like the opposite of what we want to be do, doing during the summer. It's the exact opposite of our mission in a normal summer, but it wasn't a normal summer. And we actually had, I mean, it was really, really cool. We had a great, great enrollment. We had great participation. We had great feedback. Um, and the kids loved it because at that point they'd been cooped up, you know, they'd already been cooped up. So flash forward, we then ended up reopening Butwin for a program that we called J care at camp. 
a a non-camp childcare opportunity utilizing our large outdoor campground because the campgrounds didn't need to sit empty. Right. Granted, we couldn't do everything we do in a normal summer, but for a small, small capacity, taking things like bus transportation off the table, we were able to offer that outdoor socially distanced childcare experience. And that ended up being, you know, a lot of logistical solutions that we had to come up with to make it happen, but we did make it happen. And it was, I mean, it was a smash hit too. So we were proud of that. So one of the interesting things, and I think, I don't want to take for granted that people know this, but obviously with the, 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 the two J camps, you know, Camp Butwin is, is I'm not going to call it rural. It's not like it's, you know, in the middle of nowhere. It's right on the Egan Rosemount border. So it's still in the Twin Cities metro area, as opposed to the, the Sabus camp, uh, Olami, which is on the grounds of the JCC in St. Louis Park. So they're two very different camp experiences. And with that in mind, did that sort of change how, you know, you with Butwin and, and Ali Greenstein, the director of Olami sort of went about the conversations because it's because of the, di- the different natures of the facilities. It's not like you could, you, you couldn't offer, you know, the same types of programs, right? I think we had some common logistical things we needed to work through. And I think we probably had some unique logistical things we needed to work through. I mean, once again, transportation is a great easy example because mm-hmm. in a normal summer, Olami campers arrive by car in a normal summer, we don't really want Butwin campers coming by car. We want them getting on those buses. So for us to open, we had to develop a whole car line system and convince parents that it was worth it to drive their camper out to camp. And I don't know if I should say convince. I think it was putting forth that we were making this program available, but it was it was going to be drive by car if you would like to participate. And that was what we were able to offer. Yeah. I, I would have to imagine by by that point of things, and obviously, again, last you know July, right? Nobody, nobody knew that we would still be here in March again, still doing this. But by last July, I would have to think parents might have jumped at the opportunity to put their kids in a you know, sort of safe, familiar outdoor setting to be able to, you know, be outdoors again at at camp and even though it's not a normal camp day or camp program our experience was and i just think back on this and i think we must have been crazy but at that point we were running the remote camp the hybrid the the remote specialty camp online we Mm -hmm. also had here on site at the saint paul jcc a small school age child care program happening and then while those two things were running, we were figuring out how to open Butwin. And then when we did open it, yes, yeah, some families were like, Has, where do we sign up? And we filled quickly for our very limited capacity. Other families said, ooh, we're going to do one session here. We're going to do one session at the J because the driving is, you know, a challenge. But I think, yeah, I mean, people were people were really excited to have something meaningful for their camper to participate in. And I mean, yeah, we're, we're, a, trusted, we're a trusted place for them to be. I mean, they, they know camp out when they trust us. So fast forward to this summer with, with all of the sort of wild experiences of what last year, you know, last summer looked like both virtual and, you know, limited in person, not calling it camp, but, you know, at camp, how do you plan for for what this summer is going to look like? I'd have to imagine it's got to be sort of a multi- track approach not knowing what direction things are going to go in right right um well i think you know we're learning more every day and we know so much more now than we knew when we were trying to plan for last summer but what we have as an advantage is we have last summer as a framework to build on because i think coming out of last summer we had become really pretty aware that it was so unlikely that we were going to be running camp as normal in June of this year. Like we just, we knew by the time camp J care at camp was wrapping up last summer that we were not going to be going back to like normal. So, I mean, I think it's, it's looking at what our biggest challenges are and how we can tackle those and understanding that it's going to be a modified program and staying in tune with the guidelines that we have coming from the MDH and 
the best practices that we're learning about from the ACA, which is the American Camp Association, which is our accrediting body, and trying to make the best decisions that we can based on the information that we have, knowing that that information will change and that things will change in camp planning along with that. I mean, it's just being more flexible than we've ever known how to be and being, but that's, that's camp. I mean, flexibility right. is camp. Right. Oh, I mean, even in the best of times, flexibility is camp. You, you have to, you know, the weather can change, you know, which means a field trip or, you know, an outdoor activity may not, you know, may not be able to happen because it's, you know, raining or, you know, it's too hot or, you know, whatever it's, it requires the, the ability to pivot. Exactly. So, I mean, so we go in with the goal of offering a safe experience that maintains a high quality of programming for the most kids that we feel like we can. I mean, it's a goal to fit in as many kids as we can, but how many kids we can fit is not based on a normal summer capacity. Um, right. we're, we're operating right now at about half capacity and we just have to base the decisions we have on the information, the decisions we make on the information that we have. Okay. So I was going to, you sort of answer the next question of, you know, being at half capacity, you know, as as we sit here in the first week of April, like you said, things change on a fairly, maybe not daily basis, but at least very regular, you know, things like staffing, you know, in order to have, you know, to, to increase the capacity of kids, you also have to increase the staff that you have. Do you have that sort of, you know, flexibility is one thing, but is there a pool of, you know, people on standby that, you know, might be interested in, in working should the need arise? Well, staffing is always down to the wire. I <laughs> that's, think that's the best fair. answer I can give you for that one. Fair. Um, and it just ends up being a little bit more complicated than having a pool of people that are just on standby because it, it ends up being a, a you know, an artifact of how many children can be in a group and how many groups can be at a shelter and how many kids can be on a bus. I mean, these are all things that sort of play into how many campers we can accommodate and how many staff we're going to need. And as we get closer to summer, it, it becomes more and more challenging to, to adjust the plan that we have. So we just hope that any information that we get that enables us to make those decisions um, comes sooner rather than later. So, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're eagerly and keenly watching the the information that comes out from the MDH. So given like you mentioned the MDH mentioned the ACA, I assume the uh, JCCA, the Jewish community center association, which is sort of the governing body of of the JCCs in the U S how I, I wouldn't presume that, you get sort of, you know, in counter information from each one. Are they all fairly consistent? And it, it, the case that information may run contrary to each other, who trumps whom in that case? Um, that's a great question. And actually, interestingly, um, ACA, which is the American Camp Association, has had an ongoing partnership with the CDC, and they've actually been working hard together to provide guidance. So I think that's a really wow. strong source of guidance. They, re- they they released going into summer, like a 14 chapter field guide for operating in um, in COVID. And that that was a field guide that had content for both day and overnight camps. Um, but I, I think, you know, we need to follow the guidelines that, that are set forth by the MDH, the Minnesota Department of Health. I mean, that's, that's who tells us what we can and can't do. And I think they're doing quite a good job. And I think they're quite cognizant of not contradicting the CDC guidelines. And then, you know, it may be in many cases that we decide that we need to be more cautious. You know what I mean? We're not going to, if they said, yeah, put 70 kids on a bus, I mean, I don't see that we're going to do that. I also don't see that they're going to say that. I, I don't either. And I think that's I mean, part of this is, you know, being in Minnesota and I think, you know, Governor Walls has done a, I think a great job in managing this, but also I think we, and we've seen is a little more cautious, maybe if that's the right word than, than several other States. So, you know, I, I don't think, 
all of a sudden he's going to say, yep, just, you know, buses full of kids, send them, you know, send them out. I, I don't see that happening either. Right. And again, I mean, ultimately, as long as we're complying with the guidelines that we have, we, we can be as cautious as we want to be above and beyond that. And that's, that's kind of how we, we have to operate. We have to make our own decisions that are applicable to our program, to our facility, to our community. Um, and different camps are going to make different decisions, you know, based on those criteria. And that's okay. And, and now, you know, fortunately, as as it's opened up in Minnesota, that, you know, 16 and up can get vaccinated. I mean, can you can you mandate that staff get it? We haven't at this point made a decision that we're going to mandate that staff get vaccinated. I mean, I think there's just still some questions about um, access and availability, but, um, you know, not to say that couldn't change. Sure. I think, I think that's a, a bigger question. Right. Yeah. I, it's, I, I do just sort of wonder, I know, um, it's sort of at, at least the staff can they have, they have the option to if they if they want. So, I guess I'm just curious whether that's something that the the camp should. Do you think camp should mandate that? Um, I think I think it it's determined by again factors like availability and accessibility. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, we know that. 16 plus now can in the state of Minnesota and that's awesome but we also need to make sure that there's the access piece to it right um but you know obviously I'm of the personal opinion that more shots and more arms is better yeah and hopefully when that happens we get you know at least little steps closer to to normal or whatever normal looks like to you yeah i mean it'll be little step and it'll be whatever whatever normal looks like but i i feel hopeful yeah yeah for sure for sure well ben uh thank you very much last two questions before we we uh let you get back to your planning uh what is your favorite jewish food yes i was prepared for this one lonnie oh excellent most people get caught off guard by this no i knew it was coming because if you were if we were talking at a different time of year, I would have said for sure matzo ball soup. But right now, I just want a bagel. <laughs> yeah, just a bagel. So matzo From, ball soup when it's not Passover, during Passover, a bagel. Fuck okay, man. Absolutely. What From any uh, any bagel shop in particular or the closest one that can get you bread? It just has as, to be a as, real bagel. You know, a real okay. bagel. Not a round roll with a hole in the middle, but a yes. real bagel. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, what's your favorite Jewish holiday? Uh, Pesach is my favorite. All right. Yeah. What's uh, any any aspect in particular that uh, that you like best about it? You know, the community. Um, I'm fortunate to have grown up in in a family that has a large group of um, friends and aunts and uncles and cousins that get together for Passover every year. And so that's, that's a, a huge special time for us and our family. But um, without having not been able to do that now for the last two years, I think I've, I've reflected, I think Passover in many ways, at least for me, like, it's just like this awesome microcosm of like the Jewish experience, like in so many different ways from the eating to the community, to the family, to the singing, but also the values piece and the debate piece. Um, it's just, there's, there's no other holiday that for me is like it. Well, that's excellent. Well, were you able to do something in person with people this year or, or was it again on zoom? Um, I was, I was, I was um, able to be with my folks. So just okay. very small, a very small family Seder. Yeah. All right. Well, next year with more people hopefully i hope so next year well ben savin thank you so much for joining us and giving us a little behind the scenes peek at uh uh, at what camp butwin might look like this summer and uh here's hoping to uh full buses of kids rolling into camp very soon when the time is right that's right thanks for joining us thanks for having me the who the folk podcast is part of the jew folk podcast network a product of jew folk inc Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. 
If you have suggestions for other podcast guests, please email them to me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. For our other shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. <laughs>